We read the Word of God as we find it recorded in the book of Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. The thought of the two chapters, one and two, flow closely together. And really, it all begins in the very first verses of the letter. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and then this, by whom also he made the worlds, then this amazing description of Christ, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, which he had by himself, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And then he goes on to explain why better than the angels. And now let's pick up with chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. For unto the angels he hath he not put in subjection the things to come whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, and now a lengthy quote from Psalm 8, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him, and madest him a little lower than the angels? Thou crownedest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the work of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. Into the quote of the description of what God does for man. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, Now a quote from Psalm 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And then again, now from Psalm 18. I will put my trust in him. And again, now Isaiah 8. Behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Into the quotes. For as much then... As the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily, 
He took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them, that is, to aid them that are tempted. May God bless our reading of his word. Our text for this evening is found in that 17th verse, Hebrews 2, verse 17. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. This is written by an author that some believe, many believe to be Paul, but the authorship of this letter is really unknown. It's written to Jews, Christian Jews. So they're Jews who have been converted to Christianity. They are still coming to a full understanding of what it means that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. They believe it, but they're needing, needing constantly to be grounded further in that knowledge. These Jewish Christians did struggle. And part of their struggle that's being dealt with and answered in the first part of this letter is that they anticipated that the Messiah would come in great glory and power. And so when they look at Jesus and they read of his history, they're somewhat stunned by his utter humility. And that staggers them, that that confounds them a bit. Why didn't he come with power and glory, great majesty? Isn't that what a son of David should be? So the apostle, as he writes this to them, is really answering them and answering that question. They were looking for the glory of the angels, as it were. And so that's why repeatedly, no, he doesn't have the makeup, the nature of angels. And he doesn't come as an angel. And so in verses 14 and 16, and 14 and 15 rather, he's beginning to explain, and then again in our text he explains, why not power and glory? Because the Messiah had to become a partaker of the very nature of those that he was saving in order to save them, us. He couldn't be like an angel. He didn't come to save the angels. He came to save us. And that required of him that he become like us. So he's just said in verse 16, he didn't take on himself the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Verse 14, because the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself took part of the same, the same kind of nature. That's really what Bethlehem displayed in a most powerful way. In fact, it displayed it so powerfully that you had to have faith to be able to see that that was God. He was so like us in all things. But now our text emphasizes the necessity of him being like us 
like his brethren in all things. We consider what that means, and then we consider the purpose of that, and the purpose is that he would be a high priest and make reconciliation, and then the reason is that he might display faithfulness and mercy. So first the meaning, then the purpose, and then finally the reason. Meaning. The one about whom we're talking, the one who had to take on himself our nature, had to be made like us. Let's think about that just a minute. And that's really the reason why I went back and began the reading of the scriptures in the very first part of the chapter, first part of the book. This is God. Look at verse 3, the first part. He is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's person. He displays the deity, the majesty of God. He is God. So God revealed himself through the prophets. But now this one who has that kind of majesty and glory they wanted majesty and glory. That's him. And then in verse 2, he calls him his son. Now again, this is a concept we all get, we all understand. We've used this language over and over. The son of God. The second person of the Trinity. God, truly God, completely God, came down and entered into our human nature. He was divine. That's the express image of his glory, of his person, and the brightness of his glory. Further, what's said about him is that he is at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's established in a position of great glory. In verse 9, he's made a little lower than the angels. And through the suffering of death is crowned with glory and honor. You want glory and honor? He's crowned with glory and honor. But that comes through the way of suffering. The suffering of dying. And that's how he, in verse 10, is called the captain of our salvation. Now that's the one. God the Son. Express image of his of, his, of Godhead himself, brightness of his glory, who took on himself our natures. He became like his brethren. Now, understand that we really aren't brethren naturally. We are just creatures. We're, we may have the, the right to say we're the best creatures. We're the highest creatures. But that doesn't make us anywhere near to God or anywhere near the right to be able to say Jesus is our brother. We're just a creature. The example's been given many times. Uh, we, as the highest creature, have a far closer relationship with the smallest other, of all other creatures than what God, the Creator, would have with us. We're closer to the tiniest creature than God is by virtue of being the creator with us a creature. Even without sin. But he in the scriptures here identifies those that he's going to come into a relationship with as brethren. That's interesting. He calls us Brethren, 
He has to be made like unto his brethren. How in the wide world can creatures that are dust and to dust return be called brethren? That's the wonder of election. Before God created, in his eternal mind, he knew that he would create. And in that eternal mind, it was his pleasure, good pleasure, that among those creatures would be some that he would say would enter into a relationship. He put it this way. These, some of these creatures would be given to his son. Jesus identified us that way in John 17. Those whom the Father gave to me. That's something that took place in eternity. So some of the creatures were given to the Son. Romans 8, 28. We know to them that love God that all things work together for good to them who are the called according to his purpose. Called according to his purpose. So the Creatures that are called according to his purpose are those that are given to the Son. And when they're given to the Son, then they are foreknown, foreloved, and predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son. God chose them and he eternally determined they are going to be conformed to the image of my Son. That the Son may be the firstborn among many brethren, many siblings. Election is what turned the identification of creatures to brethren. God's eternal good pleasure and purpose. These brethren... For the first 2,000 years of history, from creation until Abram, were gathered in the line of Seth, in the line of Noah, Shem and Japheth primarily, in that line. Then it came to Abram. And for the rest of old dispensational history, Abram's life is just under 2000 B.C. So from, let's just round it off, from the, for the next 2,000 years of history, those brethren came from the line of Abram, Abraham. Not all of them. Not each every, and every one of them. Romans 9 makes that very clear. Not all that are called Israel are of Israel. Neither are all they the seed of Abraham because they are children, physical children. In Isaac, not in the sons of Keturah, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Not just because they're children of the flesh, are they the children of God, but they're the children of promise. But nevertheless, for the, la the latter half of old dispensational history, the brethren came from the seed of Abraham. And now, this is a letter written to Hebrews, Jews. Hebrews are Christians who are genetically Jews, seed of Abraham. At, and even though now this is in the New Testament scriptures, the transition, the transition from new disp old dispensation to new dispensation is in the process. It's not finished yet. 
But the process of the switching to gathering his people out of every nation, tribe, and tongue began, the process of gathering out of every nation began when Jesus was born. So at the time of the birth of Christ, those brethren, those honored creatures that are called brethren, were of the line of Abraham. So when Jesus wanted to save unto himself a people, and he came and entered into the likeness of those that had were his brethren, he became a Jew. While his father was God, his mother was Mary of the tribe of Judah. And so, because the children, the other children, are partakers of flesh and blood, the kind of flesh and blood that Jesus had to take upon himself was not an angelic human nature, nor a generalized, some kind of vague, generalized human nature. But he became and took upon himself all the genetics of a Jew. Not Asian. Not Russian. Not Dutch. A Jew. Because the brethren were from that seed of Abraham. Remaining, ever remaining, there's the wonder of the manger, that, that the shepherds, those young boys that were shepherds, were given the ability to see. That the wise men, who came year later, year or so later, they were able to see in that house, that baby. They saw a baby, but they saw the Son of God. But nevertheless, they saw the Son of God in a human nature that was that of a Jew. All the joys and the sorrows of what it was to be made like unto us. He took upon himself a human nature that lay in the midst of sin. He took upon himself not, not the kind of human nature that Adam had in paradise, not the kind of human nature that we're going to have in glory, but the kind of human nature that meant to live in a sin-cursed world. Galatians says, he came under the law. He came as, as an object of the curse because he came under the law. His nature, even though he's the Son of God, was a diable nature. Weakened. Isaiah 53, the familiar words in the Handel's Messiah. Acquainted with our griefs. He was acquainted with our griefs. He entered into our life experiences. He groaned under our sufferings. He was made complete through sufferings. Chapter 5 is going to say, he learned obedience, he learned what it is to obey by the things which he suffered. He took upon himself a nature that suffered. What it meant to be flesh and blood like us. He lived our life. He died our death. He experienced our, sor our sorrows in every respect. That's why that little three-word phrase at the very beginning of our text, in all things. In ver chapter 4 of this book, verse 15, we read this, and this is getting us to the very end of the sermon, but look at it anyway. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, of our weaknesses. Just think of that. 
every weakness, every weariness, every sorrow. If you look down, you're going to see his footprints. He's walked. Every shame, every kind of shame, he was touched with a feeling of our weaknesses. He was in all points tried as we are, without sin. That's what it means when it says he was a partaker of our flesh and blood and in all things made like unto his brethren. Now the purpose for that identification with these brothers, and, and, and again, remember that brethren is used to cover the females as well as the males. That's just a generic term for both. These brethren, these that the Father gave to him, he had to become like us. To what end? What was the purpose? The purpose was so that he could be a high priest for them. A high priest so that he could make reconciliation for the sins of, now not brethren, but the people. What does a high priest do? Well again, writing to Jews, they were very familiar with the activity of a high priest. High priest was always in the service of the temple. The high priest had a responsibility that was unique to him over against all the other priests in Levites. The high priest had to go into the very presence of God, carrying the blood from the altar of burnt offerings outside the temple, entered into the holy place with the blood, stopped at the altar of incense, sprinkled incense upon it, went past and around that altar, opened up the veil once, only once a year, and all by himself went into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. He went there representing the people to God. God was in the most holy place. God's people were in the holy place. The three articles there, the table of showbread, the altar of burnt offering, and the candlelight were all representatives of God's people. He opened the drape, the veil, between that separated and he would walk through and he sprinkled the blood of the offering on the mercy seat the only way that he might approach and be in the very presence of God was it's identified as mercy seat and he sprinkled the covering for the sins of the people and he did that as a high priest, a high priest who was in the service of the tabernacle and then later the temple. The high priest was in this building which represented the relationship, the closest possible relationship. It pictured the relationship of God and his people together under the same roof. They were together. Now, now in the old dispensation, there was still that veil. But they were under the same roof. They were there together. The covenant, the spiritual building of the house of God with his people. God and his people won. That's where the high priest did his work. 
And while he did his work there, he represented the people in all things that pertain to God. The people, none of the other people, the brethren could do it. Only he did it. Jesus, in order to do that work of representing the people, high priest, he was one of them, in order for him to do that kind of work in coming before God, Jesus had to be equipped with what was necessary to be a high priest. He had to be made like unto us. Specifically, in order to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. The word, recon the word reconcile, reconciliation, means to make right. Something's wrong, it's got to be made right. There's a relationship that where two were together, and then something happens so that they're not reconciled, they're separated from each other. But to be reconciled, they've got to be brought back together, each one. Well, no, the reality is that's human nature. Both sin. One reacts to the other's sin. So we're far apart. For us to be reconciled, we both have to be brought back together. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I forgive you. Now, in the case of God, there's no sinful response. So in the case of God, we sin. We've got to be reconciled to God. God never has to be reconciled to us. He never wavers. He stays. We have to be reconciled to him. In order to make that reconciliation for the sins of his people, the high priest, the only one who could truly do it, Remember, the high priests ever since Moses were just pictures. They were only pictures. They didn't do it themselves. What did, blood did they bring? The blood of an animal. That didn't cover any sin. And they all knew it. It was a picture. A picture of the blood to come. He brings his divine blood. And he lays it on that altar. And in his death, in the shedding of his blood, he causes the veil to be rent. And now, it's all one. Not two rooms. Now it's all one. Together, God and his people reconciled. To do that, he had to identify himself. Now here's why. An animal didn't sin. Man sinned. So the death of an animal couldn't cover man's sin. He had to become man. Now on top of that, and here's the key, in order to be that kind of a high priest, he had to perform this activity pertaining to God in loving obedience. It wasn't sufficient just to suffer, just to bear the punishment. It was required of him to do it out of love. To never waver in his adoration and love of the Father. He had to love God. And being God himself, he was able in every minute of his suffering for 33 and a half years, and as that suffering grew in intensity, he never wavered and never said stop. He never wavered in his loving, loving the Lord his God with all that he had, heart, mind, soul, and strength. 
So the nature that sinned had to suffer the punishment out of love. Not just endure it. If you're just going to endure it, you're going to stay in hell forever. To bear it in love. So he took upon himself our nature. God and man. Representing man. But now with the ability, because he's God, to bear the punishment. The, the just wrath. He didn't bear part of the wrath. He bore all of that wrath. And he bore it all for each one of his siblings. Each one. And even though any one sin earned an eternity, he bore it all because he was God. So our canons say it that way. The nature of the death of this high priest was that he was able to take away, to reconcile, to expiate the sins of the whole world, if it had been God's will that they, and of ten worlds beside, if you want. It was that sufficient, that powerful. And every once in a while, those who are tried by Satan and they see the horrible ugliness of their sin, they have to be reminded of the power of the death that did cover for them. There's nothing left. He bore it all. He made reconciliation. And now notice how it's worded. The very, second to the last word of the text. He made reconciliation for the sins of the people. Not for all, in everybody in the world, or for a large number beyond the brethren. No, for them, the. Definite atonement is taught in that word, the. Definite atonement. So if he's made like us, and that's going to equip him, he's of the seed of Abraham, of our flesh and blood, and that's going to equip him to be able to do this high priestly work. And he did it. Then what's the end? The end is those two adjectives that are used to describe the high priest that he might be a merciful and a faithful high priest. <coughs> merciful. Mercy is the powerful love of God which desires to bless and make blessed those who are miserable. The powerful desire of love to bless and make blessed those who in themselves and of themselves are miserable. A deep, deep-seated desire to deliver the ones that he loves out of their misery and to give them the opposite of the experience of misery. Mercy is sometimes called a compassion because Jesus was made like unto us. Because he was touched with the feeling of our weaknesses Hebrews 4 verse verse uh, 15 because he was acquainted with our griefs and because he was numbered with us in the transgressions because he was like us in all things he knows misery so 
Sometimes we say, nobody understands the trouble I see. But you've got to finish that hymn. Nobody understands. Maybe no other human does, but Jesus does. Nobody understands the trouble I see, but Jesus. And he does. Don't let the inability for others to be sympathetic, truly understanding of you, make you think nobody does. Somebody does. He does. That's mercy. He walked where we walk. Everywhere except sin. But he went through every experience without sinning, but he went through every one. And he never fell into self-pity. He never fell into self-centeredness. But loving the Father and the brethren, he showed mercy. You know how much? Can't answer that question. Can't answer it because there's no limit. There's no dollar number. There's no limit to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why faithful, faithful, mercy and faithfulness always go together in the scriptures. You can never really separate them that beautiful hymn or versification of Lamentations 3 expresses it as well. New mercy we see, great is thy faithfulness. Psalm 89, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, and then with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Mercy and faith go together. Mercy it, it, when we put these together and want to distinguish them is like this. Mercy is one display after another. Faithfulness is what you call all of it. If, if mercy is fresh and new every morning, then you say, great is thy faithfulness. That's all of it. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord, and I, with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness. The nature of the high priest that you have, who entered into the likeness of our flesh and blood by becoming a baby in a manger, no room for him in the end, is of such a nature that he's never going to fail. He's never going to stop. If, if in his sufferings, it never grew so much for him that he said, no more, I'm not going to drink anymore, but he drank it all the way to the end. If in his suffering, he bore it all, then he never will stop. And I, we can say that with the boldness of this word of God. He will never stop in his faithfulness. You can't surpass with your sins his faithfulness. Now the child of God who understands that is not going to say, oh good, I'm going to try. Or I can do anything. No, the, the child of God who understands the greatness of that mercy and that faithfulness is so humbled that he can never stop thanking God and thanking Jesus for being that kind of an high priest. Manger scenes don't quite do that. They don't quite display what we've got here. But that's the manger. And that's the birth. And that's Bethlehem. Now the language and the wording may be a little deep for the little children. But parents, you tell them. You communicate to them 
in language that you know, just like God communicates to you in language he knows you can get. That even though there's sometimes you don't understand them, that they have someone who does. Now most of the time you're going to be able to say, I understand. They might think you really don't, but you tell them over and over, I do. You show them you do. And you show them that you do when you say, I'm sorry. Every chance you can. And how many chances do you have to say, I'm sorry? They don't end, do they? Not really. So we, knowing the mercy that's given to us, never stop thanking him. In a very weak way, that's Christmas. Praise the Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Lord, thy word is good, great, and wonderful. We get it in part. And even after we strive to explain it, we still say there's more there of the wonder of Jesus, our Lord, our High Priest. We thank him that it is declared to us most definitively that there is reconciliation for the sins of the people. May we never doubt it. Our natures want to. The devil shouts and works at it. But may we never doubt reconciliation is made. Our thanks to thee forever. Amen.